Welcome to the Amazon Legends Podcast, where we have real stories about making it big on Amazon. Our guests are CEOs of large companies and entrepreneurs who became powerful sellers, also experts specializing in helping sellers, and both former and current Amazon employees who will give us an insight from behind the scenes. Here's your host, Nick Urison. Today, my guest is Jeannie Fai. And Jeannie is the Vice President of Operations at Predicate. And she's been in e-commerce and Amazon uh, over a decade. Uh, she's used to wearing multiple hats. She's been around doing different things. But um, she spent several years in apparel industry and built an Amazon account to um, the level of multi-million dollar in sales in just four years. So um, that experience now put her in the vice president position in her current company, Predicate, where she actually works with CPG companies and um, building their brands. And the, the amount of sales that she oversees is, uh, is over half a billion. So uh, she's, if anybody wants to learn about scale, she's the person who knows how to scale. And her current company, Predicate, is actually in the business of acquiring Amazon sellers who built brands successfully. And um, also they create their own brands. So they're not just acquiring. So, uh, so today you're gonna hear all about how to do this because every entrepreneur's dream is to build something and then sell it. And mm -hmm. here you're gonna get the formula. So with that Jeannie, so tell me something that you are doing really well building these brands. What is the most important thing to you and that you are good at and why did you get so good at it? Sure, so um, I've been working with Amazon, like you said, for over a decade and Amazon is holistic in everything. So whether you're talking about inventory or you're talking about catalog listings or PPC, everything works together. And what I've found is most people don't understand or have the mindset of working Amazon centric. They always think very wholesale minded. And one really important thing is, is to work from a direct to consumer mindset to help you grow your brand. Uh, you wanna look at the environment from the consumer's point of view, not so much from a wholesale point of view. And one of the most important things that I found working with marketplaces like Amazon is that inventory is king. So you can have, you know, the most beautiful pages with the most, uh, the best ad campaigns ready to go. But if you don't have inventory, you're not going to sell anything. And I think that Amazon doesn't always make it super easy to be able to determine how much inventory you should either send into FBA or how much you should have planned if you're maybe a vendor, uh, a vendor central seller um, so that you can make sure to grow your business accordingly and not have out of stocks or have anything else that could affect your listings. So I would say inventory is probably one of the biggest factors that uh, most brands don't have a plan for, but they should. So I, I wanna dig into that a little bit, but first I wanna ask you, you said something, most sellers think of it from a wholesale standpoint, but they don't look at it. What is the difference? How, how, do, how does one become wholesale centric versus customer? What are the differences? So when you're thinking wholesale minded, you're really just thinking, I want to get you know, 10,000 units out on a pallet and you're not thinking about your customer at all. You're just thinking about moving product in a large quantity. And if you're going to be successful on Amazon or any other marketplace for that matter, you need to know who your customer is, who your demographic is, and you need to understand uh, how each individual product is selling and not think of it so much as just moving large quantities fast. Um, I know that that might sound in the weeds, but in a lot of ways with working in marketplaces like Amazon, you have to know how each of your products is doing and how you can turn different levers to make it grow faster and sell more. Um, so there is a lot of detail work when working with uh, marketplaces like Amazon. 
Um, you can't think of it so, so high level about just moving large pallets of inventory because you're never going to reach your customer. Um, and you're never going to expand that customer base into a new additional demographics. So I would say that it's just a different mindset. Um, I've worked with large CPG companies. They have internal supply chains that are very wholesale, uh, you know, directed. And there's a lot of things that you need to change internally to work with these marketplaces that those processes, wholesale processes just don't work for. Um, it can limit you greatly if you don't take into consideration um, making sure that you're, you're thinking, how can I have different ways of fulfilling products direct to consumer, not just sending out pallets? Or who is, my, who is my customer? Who am I marketing to? And then making sure that you're developing your products specifically for that demographic. Um, I think it's, it's a lot more than just a high level wholesale minded view to be successful on these marketplaces. So is it the packaging? Is it the information you put on the page in terms of being more, because I, I, I heard you say there are different ways to grow your sales. So what are some examples of those different ways? Yeah, for sure. So obviously you need to make sure that your, your product page has all the information to help someone purchase your product for what they need. One of the biggest things that I think when you're in a wholesale mind, you think you can just put a picture up, maybe put some, you know, very small facts about, you know, the dimensions or the, what the product does. Um, but you have to remember that when you're selling um, on a marketplace that People can't touch, feel, look at, hold, smell, whatever. Um, they can't do that like they can in, in, in a retail uh, brick and mortar. So you have to be able to make a page that really gives the person the best experience possible to know what they're getting in the mail so that they have a good customer experience. And by doing that, you have to really take into consideration the product images that you're putting up, making sure that it is exactly what they're going to be getting. They can see it at all different angles that you're telling them in the most efficient way possible. And I'll get to that in a, a different and in a moment, but in the most efficient way possible, all of the different things that they need to know about the product to make a decision to purchase it. And the reason I say efficient is because in most cases with people these days, you have about six seconds to keep them on your page. Um, so you're, you're running against time um, but you also want to make sure that the information you're giving them is enough for them to, to convert um, on, on the purchase and, and make them happy as a customer. Mm -hmm. So, and the other thing is conversion, right? So uh, when you hit that page as a consumer, within those six seconds, you need to show enough information that customer clicks and buys it. And, and you need to track, it's the, the, there's so many moving parts in here. So what I'm hearing from you is the, you're gonna move pallets as a result of doing things, not yes. as an objective of making the sale. Exactly. And the content becomes key in terms mm -hmm. of providing information that will bring them as close to, uh, you know, touching and feeling, so to speak, so that they feel confident enough to say, okay, I'm going to buy this all in six seconds. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fun and challenging um, marketplace to work in because um, you have such a limited amount of time to keep someone's attention on your, on your product page. Um, but the content also plays significantly into uh, search uh, results as well as your marketing. And that's when I, I just keep going back to everything is kind of interlocked, right? Um, everything is holistically playing together. So you need to, as a, if you're the CEO of a brand, if you're uh, on an e-commerce team for a brand, or maybe even an agency working, you have to think of it holistically and you have to understand that other parts or other departments might be affecting your significant like attribution. So like if you are in the advertising team and you might see like a dip in your your uh, your spike in 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 bids or your ACOS is higher, your ROAS um, isn't where it should be, 
And then when you dive down into it, it could be an inventory issue. You know, that might be playing a large role into why your, your campaigns aren't working as well as they used to a month ago. So you have to be able to work as a team if you have multiple teams um, or departments internally. Um, and you have to be able to have somebody at a large, um, on, a, on a big picture level, being able to look at all of the data, which there's a ton of, um, and be able to decipher the why, um, which can be a very big challenge um, in, in you know, pinpointing exactly why something is happening within your sales. Um, but I feel like there's so much data that Amazon does provide sellers that you can usually come to a very good conclusion as to what is going on. So I want to go back to what you are really good at. So as far as inventory, so what, what you said is basically, you know, all these PPC campaigns, the content, they're very important. It's, it's not just one thing. So they've got to be there. However, if you don't have inventory, it doesn't matter, right? Everything doesn't matter. Starts. So, uh, and you manage inventory really well, FBA, FBM, mm -hmm. because sometimes, because Amazon takes a long time to receive something or whatever. So it's always a good idea to have that backup listing so that you're fulfilling yourself. Um, so what data are you looking at? How do you, how do you manage inventory so well? What do you do? What data do you, do you look at? And then what you do based on what the data shows? So for me, like if I'm managing inventory, say for FBA uh, specifically, I do look at historical sales um, and I, I look at, you know, past 30, 60 day demand, but I also look at previous years, historical sales. Um, so I can see how seasonality or trends might affect in the coming weeks as well. So, and then I also look at things like excessive uh inventory, aged units. Uh, I look at Amazon's restock data, as well as, of course, we have to manage storage limits now. Um, if there's any kind of additional promotional plans that might be happening, whether that's with advertising or a promotional run for like a lightning deal or a deal of the day, all of that needs to be um, put into a report and built out so that you can determine what is your what is your demand going to be like in the next six to eight weeks? Um, one thing that I do religiously with any, any account that I work with is we do at least 52 turns a year um, of inventory to FBA. And the reason we do that is because of how hyper dynamic the market is on Amazon. And we wanna make sure that we always know that we're going to have inventory when it's needed, um, just because we run the report 52 times a year or sometimes even more, doesn't mean we necessarily send inventory in every single time, but we're always watching it because you never know when there's going to be a significant increase in your sales or there could be something that's declining significantly. And you're, you're gonna wanna watch that from a PO standpoint when you're purchasing products for the future. Um, and this way you can stay relatively I would say uh, it could meet, you, you're making calculated risks, but you're taking less risk on inventory this way because you're being hyper vigilant on how the market is playing with your inventory. And, but then also just keeping and maintaining a healthy inventory on Amazon only puts your, you know, your IPI score in a better situation and allows you more storage because you're selling to what has sales velocity, but it also keeps your account in good health. And as I'm sure you know, that's very important when selling in a marketplace like Amazon. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm hearing is you have potentially weekly shipments to Amazon facility if the data shows that you need to replenish. Correct. So you need to. And also another thing that I, you know, data happens to be my, my passion and I'm always working on stuff. Uh, there's, there's a few things that I always apply as a methodology. First and foremost, define the data points, what data points you're going to look at, right? So you mentioned several. And, mm -hmm. and then 
also maintain consistency. In other words, don't look at it Monday this week and then Wednesday next week and then skip the week, week after. Always Monday, 10 o'clock, whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. And the other thing is you have Amazon releasing this data, not necessarily through API. I mean, you have to download this data. You, there is no easy easy task with Amazon uh, data. You have to download it and some of the reports don't become available until the following day at six o'clock. And of course it's six o'clock Pacific time, which means nine o'clock. So all these things you have to take into account, right? So it's, it's not for, uh, it's not walk in the park. No, you know, there's a lot of different reports to pull. There's a lot of things you need to think about. Some of the reports or some of the data that is available in, in Seller Central isn't even available to pull in a report. So like, for example, one thing that I found that has influenced my inventory reports is the receiving time or the shipping time for my inventory to Amazon. And there isn't a clear report to be able to pull to, to get a good estimate of like, okay, at this FC, it's taking this amount of time to get received in. So I know, and I can put that into my, my weeks uh, of coverage, right? Um, so I, you know, I've developed tools in, in, in the past to help with things like that. You know, automation will help you if it's the right automation to be able to streamline some of these processes, make it a little less manual and a little less overwhelming. So um, there are tools out there. Um, I've used some uh, third-party tools, but I've also built some. And I think that depending on what your business needs and, and, and how, you know, the skill level in, in, inside your business will determine what kind of tools you can use to help, uh, you know, mitigate some of the, the complicatedness of pulling all these reports and looking at all the data. So uh, tell me if you agree that I, I've spoken to, I mean, obviously I, I speak to different sellers all the time and the general consensus seems to be to manage your inventory efficiently. There is no tool out there. You have to build it yourself for, for your needs. You can pull data from different places. There are some tools to get you the data, but to know your replenishment needs you had to build it yourself pulling the data from different places would you agree with that um i would agree with that I, i've helped you know i've used internal tools that i've built before um they're not math you know they're not public um, but i do think that there's some tools that people are working on um, to help get to that point one thing I will say, and, and I think every CEO might, might hate this, but it's, uh, it's true, is that there is no one way for every seller. Every business is very unique um, and there's always different you know, situations per seller that make you know, the need for customization. Um, when managing things, whether that's your catalog or inventory. So you have to, you know, be able to adapt. And I think that that's one weakness that some third party apps or tools have is that they're very generic in some senses because they need to be have mass appeal, right? Mm -hmm. But they will only give you a certain amount of data and then you still need to add to that data to make it a little bit more customized for your needs. Um, so I do agree with you in the sense that there is nothing that's going to solve everyone's problem and there probably never will be. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so the bottom line here for everybody listening is you <laughs> get ready for some real heavy duty Excel work. So uh, yeah. it's a, you have to build your own, you have to, first you have to define your needs as far as your, how, how many pieces you need per SKU. And for that, you need to define the data points that you need to be looking at, you know, the receiving time by Amazon, you know, your IPI score, mm -hmm. and your traffic. Traffic is another one that, that you have no control over it, right? So right. your traffic, your conversion rate, you may be converting worse now than you did before or better. So all the, the so many data points that you have to list them. And then you have to make a list of where you're going to get that data. And yeah. then build your comprehensive Excel 
file that will process it to tell you how many pieces you should send. And, and you do that weekly at the same time, same day, <laughs> you know, yes. right? So that yeah. seems to be the formula. Okay, yeah, if you it, want to scale, that's what you need to do. It definitely works for us. Um, I, I won't say that, you know, you shouldn't use any third party, um, you know, software or apps. I think there's definitely things out there that can help, like I said, make things more efficient to a certain point and automate certain things. Like even just pulling the reports, you know, um, through the APIs. If you know that you're going to need a report every week at the same time, there are tools that can help you schedule those reports and have them available for you ahead of time, so that when you come into the office, they're there for you. You don't have to go in and wait to process them. Um, you know, there's other reports that, or other tools. I'm sorry that you can use to help make the process more efficient. But at some point, every Body is going to have to make some customizations to the reporting um, to make it work for their business. Yeah, uh, and I think that that's just it's just the way that it is. Um, but yeah, I 100% agree with you. It does have to be something that you do um, on a, a very scheduled basis every week. Um, so make sure that you're catching any anomalies, um, making sure that you're in a good, healthy position and that you're staying on top of it. I mean, that's the biggest thing in e-commerce is that it changes constantly. Uh, it's a challenge and you have to have your finger on the pulse um, to make sure that you're you know, making it work and growing your business. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is, uh, it, it's not easy, but of course the rewards are there. So let's, um, let's now move on to a little bit more interesting part since you are working with multiple brands and you're building brands to build value basically what makes it a good acquisition target how how do you how do you pick what do you what makes you say okay this is worth looking at it's a good target what is a good target is it the sales volume is it the profitability uh, what are those things? Is it content? What are you looking for? So a couple of things that I look for when thinking about which brands to take on is one, they have to be profitable. I mean, there's just no point in taking on something that can't be. So you need to look at the market space see what your competitors are doing. Can you run into a price point that can be competitive as well and remain profitable on the marketplace? Um, the other part that I look at is quality. So one thing that I think some people can rush to the marketplace with a product, but it might not be the best quality. And overall, you're going to get bad reviews over time and it's just going to hurt your brand. So we look for brands that we feel passionate about, we feel is a good product, um, and we know that it has good quality. But then we know that we can, when you have a product that's good quality, you can actually sit it at a price point where you know you're going to be profitable because it has the, it's the right, it's made of good quality materials. The, the customer is going to be able to use it and enjoy it. And we feel like it is a quality product. Um, so I think that when you believe in your products and, or brands, it's just going to help you sell it better. Um, if you're putting up stuff just to put up listings to see if they will sell or not, I, I feel like that's just a, a recipe for disaster because you're never going to have the right mentality behind it. Um, I, I mentioned before, it, there's a lot of detail in the weeds kind of of mindset that you have to do on a product by product basis when you're running on these marketplaces. And if you don't care about the product, you're not going to give it the attention it needs to succeed. And if you don't care about the quality of the product, then that means that you don't care about what your customers are getting. And overall, that's just not a good combination. So we try and make sure that we're bringing quality products to people at really good prices. Um, that way they can, you know, everybody can enjoy them. So that's, that's kind of what we look for. 
So let's dig into those things. Uh, what is a good price? What is a, an attractive price point? So it really depends on what category you're in. And, and, and oh, and by the way, any particular category, a favorite, or does not matter? So I tend, I, this is just a personal preference and I have no idea why, but I tend to like complicated catalogs. So I think it's because I, I started in apparel and accessories. I love apparel and accessories. I love shoes, uh, uh, highly competitive categories like baby and beauty, large complex catalogs. They just challenge me. So I like those, but I've worked with catalogs from, you know, you know, catalog sizes of like three ASINs all the way up to like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of ASINs. And I don't, I don't really think that if you believe in the product, it really doesn't matter what the category is per se. Um, uh, but I, I, one of our main brands that we work with is shoes. Uh, it's a women's shoe brand. Um, and, um, I've worked in every category you could think of. I mean, I've sold chemicals on Amazon, which is super fun with compliance. Um, and I've, I've sold, you know, baby pet, um, all kinds of different categories. Uh, I think that from a price point perspective though, it really depends on what your product is and what is, what is the, the, consumer looking for? What does the competitive landscape look like? Um, if you're, you have a product that's higher quality using, you know, maybe it's a little bit more luxurious, say it's a pet collar that's made of leather, pure genuine leather. Uh, it has, you know, higher quality finishing on it. You know, those are price points that can be a little bit higher, but you have to make sure that you're clearly stating why your product deserves that higher price point. And I think that when you're in an atmosphere of, of, from the customer's perspective, searching on Amazon, they're just barrage, you know, they put in dog collar and they just have hundreds of thousands of, of results that pop up. And you have to be very good at showing in your, your search listing image and title, why it deserves to be that price, because the price point is what people look at first on Amazon. Um, so it's really important that you pull through why you need to be at a higher price point if you're going to list a, a luxurious product on Amazon. So as far as the what I get from some sellers is we want to make it very cheap and sell quality. Mm -hmm. So what do you say about that approach? Um, it's not something that I would personally do. Um, I think that you're going to sell quantity, but on the back end, you have to realize all of the returns, all of the customer service that's probably going into dealing with the lack of uh, customer, um, you know, happiness when they get that product and they realize it's not a good quality product. Um, and, and that can play into, you know, you, your listings having low reviews, which can cause low conversion over time. So I feel like you're just playing a time game at that point. Um, it's not a long-term play um, because you're eventually, you know, the way that people search on Amazon is the reviews are one of the most important parts. And if you're seeing that the product is breaking or not as described, um, that might, you know, really affect the quantity, which is all you're really looking for when you're selling a, a cheaper product, um, th that will make your quantities of, uh, you know, in sales go down, and then you're going to have to start over with a new product. Uh, so to me, it's not a long-term play. You need to make a product that either you're willing to improve upon when you get that feedback from the customer, um, or, that you know you know is a good quality product and, and you're getting the reviews to back it up so um, one of the things i say is don't focus on the price focus on the value establish the value communicate it you know that's where the co content comes in so you know people will and you have to differentiate yourself you can't just be charging a high price without showing why you're doing exactly that. yeah so um yeah that's important so good quality as far as reviews, so I mean, we know reviews are important. 
how many reviews would you look for in a listing for you to say, okay, this is a good listing? Um, I mean, nowadays, I would say that you would need at least, you know, they say like 15 is a good place to start to like start launching your product and putting a lot of marketing campaign behind it. Um, I would say for people to feel pretty secure about the product is it's going to need a couple hundred reviews um, on it to show that there's a lot of demand for it, that people want to purchase and are purchasing that product and that they're seeing that it, it, it is actually a good quality product. Um, so I would say a couple hundred. A couple hundred, okay. Ah, well, that, that's very valuable. So um, as, a, as an acquisition target, obviously they have to be profitable, no point, because then that they, they are building brand equity but they are just building it, right? So it's not like they are Nike that everybody knows about. So there is no, if you like, intellectual property value yet established. So it all comes down to cash flow. What, what are you generating? So uh, what is a good acquisition target in terms of sales volume? And what kind of profitability is attractive percentage? So uh, we look at, uh, many different things when we're acquiring a brand. One is if the current manufacturer, if we can find a way to manufacture it some at, at a different, you know, facility um, with larger quantities at a lower cost to help profitability. So that's something that we will look at. Um, but of course, we don't want to we don't want to take away from any of the quality. So we make sure that the quality stays the same. Um, but overall, from a profitability standpoint, we want to see that, you know, we have a good, you know, 20, 30 percent profitability uh, rate on the brands that we're going to bring in. Now, it's dependent also of, you know, what is the price point going to be? If it's a higher luxury item, we might be willing to know that like, we're going to know we're not probably not going to sell thousands a day because it's a higher price point product. But we want to make sure that when we do sell something like that, that we are seeing at least, you know, a 15 to 20% uh, return on our investment for, for a product uh, at a higher price point. If it's a lower price point, um, we're, you know, we're willing to take a little bit less because we will sell higher quantity uh, of those. Um, but um, of course, we try to make sure that we're putting the best product out there to the market. Um, as far as decision making, when we're trying to determine like which brands to acquire or what products to make internally, um, it really is just looking at the landscape and the demand of what we're seeing is increasing um, within uh, the the different categories. So if we're seeing like you know I think two years ago the pet category blew up um, when COVID happened. Um, and that was something that, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, brands that I worked with in the past jumped on and they saw great benefits from it. You just have to make sure that when you're looking at the demand um, and the different uh, category increases, that it's not something that's going to be a short term increase due to a certain, you know, maybe it is because of COVID or for example, puzzles. I'm not sure if you knew, but during COVID, the puzzle category just took off it went to like number one I think puzzles was like the number one search term uh, for a while and um, if you can't turn around and get it to market fast enough you're going to miss that opportunity you need to find demand that is long term and is going to stick around for you to have a successful brand to bring in and how do you know it's a long term rather than a fad so it, I would say it needs to be a commodity item, something that people are going to need and want to use and something that, you know, they're going to need over and over again is a good, a good example. So people always need shoes and they're always going to buy shoes. Um, same with socks, you know, things that people need are always a good starting point. If you're dealing with something that's a little bit more of a one-time purchase only, um, that's where I would say you need to just def define a differential. So like whether that's different, uh, you know, bundles or different colorways, ways to get people to 
to want to purchase more of the same product, um, you can make it a long-term play that way. Um, I just, there's different ways to market products like that, but I would say you just have to think of long-term, like, is this something that someone is only going to buy once and there's just a very small demographic that's looking at it? Or is this something that I can appeal and can appeal to a mass audience and that they can buy over and over again? And I think once you define that and you can market it a certain way and it has that usage, that's going to help you in the long term. So I'm hearing consumables make more attractive targets. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so let's uh, talk about the the biggest question: What is the valuation? How do you value? What, is it is it going by the the net profit? Or is it going the, by the, the top line multiples? Uh, can you give us some range of how it works? Uh, so we really just take it all. It is, we do look at profitability overall, and we want to make sure that we see that there's a demand there. But then we also take it off of feel, too. So we're not going to take a human element out of this. I, I think a lot of people, CEOs or, or other uh, companies, they want to a very finite equation on how to know when to acquire a brand and or how to develop a brand and know that it's going to be successful. There isn't one. Um, and you're always going to have to take into consideration a gut feeling, personal, uh, you know, emotion towards a product. We're all humans. We all shop for things. And I'm, I'm, I shop on Amazon. I know everyone in, in the company that I work for shops on Amazon. Um, so our insights and how we are feeling about a product are significant. So if we know that we can be, we can be profitable and we have a good feeling about the brand, that's something that we do take into a large consideration when we're deciding whether to acquire a brand or develop a brand. And, and how do you come to the, the, the valuation of it? Is it, uh... Do you go by if it's a, say they are doing a million dollars in sales with twenty percent net bottom line, so it means two hundred thousand dollars. Is it a multiple of two hundred thousand or a million dollars? And what is that multiple? What is the range? So I mean, we've taken on large brands that have you know somewhat established a brand awareness on Amazon, but then we've also brought in brands that have no brand awareness on Amazon at all. And I would say it's really dependent upon the the beliefs of what you're capable as a company if you know that you can market it and bring it to the mass then we're going to try and do that so i wouldn't say that we have a finite i'm not going to give a finite answer to that because we've brought in products where we do have you know the top line is millions of dollars and we're seeing you know a, a good chunk of that coming back from an ROI standpoint. However, we have other brands that we do not see that yet, but we know that in the future that they're going, we're going to grow them to that. If we feel that we can see a pathway forward to getting them to a multi-million dollar brand, uh, we're going to take it on. I see. So what I'm hearing is there is no set formula to this. And, and also, Another thing I'm hearing is depending on who you are dealing with uh, in terms of their familiarity with the category, like from what you're telling me is you understand certain categories and you're passionate about certain categories. So when you come across a brand or a seller that's building a brand in those categories, your, your approach is very different than maybe somebody else. Right. And, and, and yes. therefore, and that reflects in the valuation of the company. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it, it, this is no answer, but it is the answer. So, uh, and I, I, I've always, you know, I, I heard this long time ago when I started in the internet business back in 1996, 97, people invest in two things. They either invest in the business they know or they invest in the people they know. So if you go to somebody uh, who doesn't understand the business and they don't know you and you're pitching them, you're wasting your time, right? Right. 
yeah. and so on. And, and you just said that you uh, you acquire brands that are in categories that you are familiar with. So, and by the way, what are those categories for for your firm, so that everybody knows? Yeah, so we do shoes, women's shoes. Um, we do home goods, and then we do uh, nutritional supplements. So those are the three categories that we play in currently. Um, I don't think that, you know, we're closed minded to any other categories. It's just something that we know very well. Um, and obviously my background's in apparel and accessories and shoes. So uh, one of the reasons that I was brought on to the, to the team was, was due to my experience there but also with a ton of other categories due to my time in agency. So I think that, you know, those are our main categories right now, but, you know, we've talked about looking at, you know, the toy category and even, you know, pet category. So we're open to other categories. Um, and then it's also just finding the right internal resources to bring on. So there's a ton of great, uh, skilled people who have that, that experience that you're talking about in those other categories and making sure that, you know, you're building out your team to work with what you're planning on building out from a brand perspective as well is very important. Yeah. So that actually is a good segue to my next question. So uh, one of my favorite questions is, uh, what does it take to make a successful seller operation? in terms of team, what are the roles? Now, that's my question, but in your case, I wanna tweak it a little bit. As an acquisition target, do you look for well-defined infrastructure, uh, well-defined roles uh, of a team in a company, or if they've done a good job, but they've been winging it and they just happen to be successful and, and you don't care about how they got there as long as they got there. So give us your take of what makes it a good target and then give us your ideal kind of acquisition target in terms of team. What should be the, what, what should the company be doing in terms of roles and, and doing it well? Sure, so I think when it comes to acquiring a brand, you know, if there are team members within that brand that have a lot of knowledge about the product, um, and have the skills to be able to work in marketplaces like Amazon, we would definitely you know, consider bringing them on as we acquire that brand. Um, otherwise, we, my, my vision and uh, how to build out a team is having people who are very uh, Amazon centric. So keeping their finger on the pulse, understanding the nuances and changes that are happening in the marketplace on a daily, um, but then to break it down, to be a little bit more, um, detailed, you know, obviously I mentioned before that inventory is a huge part of, of running this. So having a demand planner, um, someone who knows Amazon and, and the different nuances there and all of the different data points is, is, is absolutely key. Having someone who can maintain the catalog um, so a catalog manager and uh, or a just an account coordinator, someone who is good at, you know, managing the listings, managing case management, doing things like account health management, uh, making sure that everything within the account is, is, is staying on track. That's, that's very key. Someone who is in-depth uh, knowledge at PPC is extremely important when it comes to Amazon. Um, so I would say that those are the main, and then you need someone from a high level perspective to bring in strategy, someone who can look at the entire business and think, this is what we need to do to turn it to 11. Here are the different tasks that I'm going to then dev out to this team that I've now built to put in place the different campaigns during different times of the year, making sure I have inventory and at the right time. Um, and, you know, pu pulling all of these uh, team members together when you're, you're creating a new product launch. Um, so someone who can look at the high level, make sure that you're staying profitable, but also coming up with ways 
to do A-B testing, to try new things, to take it to the next level from a growth standpoint. I think those are the main positions that are going to be heavily um, influential in your growth. So what I heard you say is if there are people who have established themselves as an expert in their area, they get to stay on when you acquire the brand, um, but otherwise some may not because Correct. you already have. Um, yes. So the, the, the biggest question in this is when you acquire, does the, the owner get to stay on? Do you get to keep the owner or do you say that? Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> and now we have it. Uh, normally um, we, it, it's a mutual sale between us and the brand. Um, and we usually take it over from a complete IP standpoint. So uh, after that, you know, the owner usually does not stay on, at least in our experience, but the brands that we have. Um, now, if they would want to stay on as a consultant, you know, to help uh, bring any insights and questions, we, we definitely always encourage that. Uh, but from an ownership standpoint, we are the owner at that point once we acquire the brand. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if they are picking up a check, <laughs> yeah. they're not gonna they're not gonna have their cake and eat it. So uh, this is really great, uh, Jenny. This is uh, this is the kind of information everybody is wondering about, and but there isn't really one place. So uh, you are helping a lot of people right now. So um, my favorite last question is knowing Amazon the way you do. If you could wish one thing for Amazon to change in their policies for sellers, what would that be? There's so many things. Um, the biggest thing that I wish Amazon would change is their transparency with changes. Um, so I mentioned that things change a lot. Amazon does do an okay job of, you know, sending out news bulletins here and there. But I've actually noticed in, in the years that I've done this that you know, the policy pages change without any kind of update to the sellers to know that it's changed. Um, or they, they're they creating changes before they put out the help pages for the seller to know what's going on. And I think that if we could create a little bit more transparency for the sellers on when things are changing, um, it will help them be able to be more proactive instead of reactive. I feel like sometimes sellers, myself included, are always reacting because the communication isn't always there. Um, again, I, I'm sure from the Amazon side of things, keeping all those help pages up to date is a task in its, of itself. Um, but just to make sure that we can be successful um, and stay compliant within Amazon's policies, I would just ask that there would be a better way that Amazon could be a little bit more transparent of those changes and keeping the sellers up to date on those changes. Yeah, we always say the only constant is change, right, with yes. Amazon. So yes. if they are not communicating that, that's mm -hmm. really not good. So uh, this is great. So tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Genie Fi. Who is Genie Fi and where are you based? and uh, give us also we're going to obviously publish this on our website and also on youtube with your contact information give us your contact information how they can reach the company how they can reach you personally give us all that and and tell us about what you do outside of work what are your passions sure so a little bit about me like you said i've been in e-commerce for over a decade i've been a brand i've worked for an agency and now I'm um, the, the VP of operations at Predicate, which is a, a brand acquisition and, and brand incubator. Um, um, as far as you know, getting in contact with me, if you wanna get in contact with, with Predicate, you can reach out to through our website. Um, if you want to see some of our brands, uh, Jay Adams is one of our largest brands. It's a women's shoe brand. There's also, uh, Sun Sunbay Foods and um, Slice of Goodness, which is a home goods brand. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, I, I'm always available on LinkedIn. 
Uh, you can just search Genie Pie and I will pop up. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one <laughs> with that name. Um, and as far as, you know, when I'm not working, um, I would say, you know, just spending time with my family. Uh, I like reading. I'm a big in, into reading and true crime and all that uh, stuff. So I try and keep up with all of the different things that are coming out there. Um, I, I'm located in Cincinnati, Ohio. So, um, you know, dealing with the different weather uh, every day. So some days it's like 60 degrees outside and the next day it'll be 20 and snowing. So it's always fun here to keep up. Um, but um, one thing that I've been doing with my family is, you know, to stave off some of the, the COVID, you know, staying inside and just being, you know, quarantined all the time is uh, on a weekend, every, every couple of weeks, we'll go to a new city about, you know, maybe an hour or three hours away and just kind of, you know, get to know that city, see, like look around, try new food places and, and breweries and that kind of thing, just to kind of get out and try new things, uh, but try and stay safe at the same time. Yeah, well, that's nice. It, it's, uh, it's, first of all, it's fresh air, right? Yes. <laughs> staying inside all the time it's uh well that i hope we never go back to that those days that that was not fun that was not fun yeah i agree okay. all right well thank you uh Jeannie. this this was great this is the kind of information that um, will help a lot of people it gives you a direction because everybody you know we all get up in the morning and we're trying to do things but uh, when you put things in perspective what are you working for and th this is really it so um Thank you very much. And uh, this brings us to the end of this episode. And uh, I'll say goodbye and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Be sure and subscribe, rate and review our show. And be sure and share an episode with a friend. And thank you so much for being with us today. We'll see you next week here on Amazon Legends. Thank you.